Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves Hi everybody, my name is Natasha and I've been commanded by His Royal Highness Prince Bertie the Frog to tell you the story Nori of Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves. But first, here's a piece of gossip I picked up about Bertie and his friends. As it happens, it was a bit of a gloomy and rainy day down in the pond. Bertie was trying to think of a trick to play on Colin the Carp, but was finding it a bit difficult. Just then, Barker the dog ran up to the pond. Woof! Woof! said Barker. Oh no! said Tim the Tadpole. Barker has stolen some sausages from the kitchen! And sure enough, three fat juicy sausages were hanging from Barker's mouth. Now, Bertie was a bit nervous of Barker because he was a very big and bouncy dog, which was all very well when you're a prince, but is a bit scary when you're just a frog. But if there was one thing that Bertie was even more afraid of than Barker, it was the palace cook. Do you know why Bertie was afraid of the palace cook? You haven't heard? Well, I'd better explain. You see, when Bertie used to be a prince... Sometimes he would get a bit peckish. And he used to creep into the kitchen and take some biscuits and some cake and sometimes even some chocolates. The cook would get very cross and chase him out of the kitchen with a rolling pin in her hand. So when Bertie saw Barker drop the sausages by the pond and he saw the cook running down the path, he was a bit afraid because the cook might think he had stolen them. Where's that stupid dog? shouted the cook. Woof, woof, said Barker, running away and leaving the sausages behind. Quick, Tim, hide those sausages, croaked Bertie. I haven't got any legs, squeaked Tim. Colin, Colin, hide the sausages, croaked Bertie to Colin the carp. I haven't got any legs either, said Colin. Anyway, I don't like sausages. Oh no, said Bertie. We're going to be in so much trouble. Well, Bertie, why are you looking so worried today? said Sadie the Swan, gliding across the pond. I'm fine, said Bertie. But I must say, you look very pretty today, Sadie. Sadie blushed a little, but you couldn't really tell because, of course, her feathers don't change colour. How kind you are, Bertie, she said. Truly a gentleman amongst pond life. Could you just sit over there by the side of the pond so I can admire you, said Bertie. And Sadie climbed out of the pond and sat down right on top of the sausages. So even when the cook searched and searched, she could not find the sausages. And she couldn't blame Bertie or Barker or any of the rest of the pond life. And Barker was so pleased when he got his sausages again. He promised not to jump into the pond and splash everybody, at least for a whole week. Now, as it happens, today's story is all about stealing things. Not that you should ever steal things. Not even chocolates from the kitchen. So do you want to hear Bertie's story Nori for today? Do you really? Very well. Listen quietly and I will tell you the story Nori of Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves from a book called The Thousand and One Arabian Nights. In a town in Persia there lived two brothers, one named Kasim, the other Ali Baba. Kasim was married to a rich wife and lived in luxury while Ali Baba had to maintain his wife and children by cutting wood in a neighbouring forest and selling it in the town. One day, when Ali Baba was in the forest, he saw a troop of men on horseback coming toward him in a cloud of dust. He was afraid they were robbers and climbed into a tree for safety. When they came up to him and dismounted, he counted 40 of them. They unbridled their horses and tied them to trees. The finest man among them, whom Ali Baba took to be their captain, 
went a little way among some bushes and said, Open sesame! So plainly that Ali Baba heard him. A door opened in the rocks, and having made the troop go in, he followed them, and the door shut again of itself. They stayed inside some time, and Ali Baba, fearing they might come out and catch him, was forced to sit patiently in the tree. At last the door opened again, and the forty thieves came out. As the captain went in last, he came out first and made them all pass by him. He then closed the door, saying, Shut, sesame! Every man bridled his horse and mounted. The captain put himself at their head, and they returned as they came. Then Ali Baba climbed down and went to the door concealed amongst the bushes and said, Open, sesame! And it flew open. Ali Baba, who expected a dull, dismal place, was greatly surprised to find it large and well lighted, hollowed by the hand of a man in the form of a vault, which received light from an opening in the ceiling. He saw rich bales of merchandise, silk, stuffed brocades all piled together, and gold and silver in heaps and money and leather purses. He went in and the door shut behind him. He did not look at the silver, but brought out as many bags of gold as he thought his asses, which were browsing outside, could carry, loaded them with bags, and hid all with faggots. Using the words, Shut sesame! He closed the door and went home. Then he drove his asses into the yard, shut the gates, carried the money bags to his wife, and emptied them out before her. He bade her keep the secret, and he would go and bury the gold. Let me first measure it, said his wife. I will go borrow a measure of someone while you dig the hole. So she ran to the wife of Kasim and borrowed a measure. Knowing Ali Baba's poverty, the sister was curious to find out what sort of grain his wife wished to measure, and artfully put some toffee at the bottom of the measure. Ali Baba's wife went home and set the measure on the heap of gold and filled it and emptied it often to her great content. She then carried it back to her sister without noticing that a piece of gold was sticking to it, which Kasim's wife noticed directly as soon as her back was turned. She grew very curious and said to Kasim when he came home, Kasim, your brother is richer than you. He does not count his money, he measures it. He begged her to explain this riddle, which she did by showing him the piece of money and telling him where she found it. Then Kasim grew so envious that he could not sleep, and went to his brother in the morning before sunrise. Ali Baba, he said, showing him the gold piece. You pretend to be poor, and yet you measure gold. By this Ali Baba perceived that through his wife's folly, Kasim and his wife knew their secret, so he confessed all and offered Kasim a share. That I accept, said Kasim, but I must know where to find the treasure, otherwise I will discover all and you will lose all. Ali Baba, more out of kindness than fear, told him of the cave and the very words to use. Kasim left Ali Baba meaning to get the treasure for himself. He rose early next morning and set out with ten mules loaded with great chests. He soon found the place and the door in the rock. He said, Open sesame! And the door opened and shut behind him. He could have feasted his eyes all day on the treasures, but he now hastened to gather together as much of it as possible. But when he was ready to go, he could not remember what to say for thinking of his great riches. Instead of sesame, he said, Open barley! And the door remained fast. He named several different sorts of grain, all but the right one, and the door still stuck fast. He was so frightened about the danger he was in, 
that he had as much forgotten the world as if he had never heard it. About noon the robbers returned to their cave and saw Cassim's mules roving about with great chests on their backs. This gave them the alarm. They drew their sabres and went to the door, which opened on their captain saying, Open Sesame! Cassim, who had heard the trampling of their horses' feet, resolved to sell his life dearly. So when the door opened, he leapt out and threw the captain down. In vain, however, the robbers with their sabres soon killed him. On entering the cave, they saw all the bags laid ready and could not imagine how anyone had got in without knowing their secret. They cut Cassim's body into four quarters in order to frighten anyone who should venture in and went away in search of more treasure. As night drew, Cassim's wife grew very uneasy and ran to her brother-in-law and told him where her husband had gone. Ali Baba did his best to comfort her and set out to the forest in search of Cassim. The first thing he saw on entering the cave was his dead brother. Full of horror, he put the body on one of his asses and bags of gold on the other two and covering all with some faggots, returned home. He drove the two asses laden with gold into his own yard and led the other two to Cassim's house. The door was opened by the slave Morgiana, whom he knew to be both brave and cunning. Unloading the ass, he said to her, This is the body of your master, who has been murdered, but whom we must bury, as though he had died in his bed. I will speak with you again, but now tell your mistress I am come. The wife of Cassim, on learning the fate of her husband, broke out into tears and cries. But Ali Baba offered to take her to live with him and his wife, whereupon she agreed and dried her eyes. Morgiana, meanwhile, sought a doctor and asked him for some lozenges. My poor master, she said, can neither speak nor eat. She carried home the lozenges and returned next day weeping and asked for an essence only given to those just about to die. Thus in the evening, no one was surprised to hear the wretched shrieks and cries of Cassim's wife and Morgiana telling everyone that Cassim was dead. The next day, after Morgiana went to an old cobbler near the gates of the town, who opened his stall early, put a piece of gold in his hand and bade him follow her with his needle and thread. Having bound his eyes with the handkerchief, she took him to the room where the body lay, pulled off the bandage and bade him sew the quarters together, after which she covered his eyes again and led him home. Then they buried Cassim, and Morgiana, his slave, followed him to the grave, weeping and tearing her hair. While Cassim's wife stayed at home, uttering lamentable cries. Next day she went to live with Ali Baba, who gave Cassim's shop to his eldest son. The forty thieves, on their return to the cave, were much astonished to find Cassim's body gone and some of their money bags. We are certainly discovered, said the captain, and shall be undone if we cannot find out who it is that knows our secret. Two men must have known it. We have killed one, we must now find the other. To this end, one of you who is bold and artful must go into the city dressed as a traveller and discover whom we have killed, and whether men talk of the strange manner of his death. If the messenger fails, he must lose his life lest we be betrayed. One of the thieves started up and offered to do this, and after the rest had highly commended him for his bravery, he disguised himself and happened to enter the town at daybreak just by Baba Mustafa's door. The thief bade him good day, saying, Honest man, how can you possibly see to stitch at your age? Old as I am, replied the cobbler, I have very good eyes, and will you believe me when I tell you that I sewed a dead body together in a place where I had less light than I have now? 
The robber was overjoyed at his good fortune, and giving him a piece of gold, desired to be shown the house where he stitched up the dead body. At first Mustafa refused, saying that he had been blindfolded. But when the robber gave him another piece of gold, he began to think he might remember the turnings if blindfolded as before. This means succeeded. The robber partly led him, and was partly guided by him, right in front of Kasim's house, the door of which the robber marked with a piece of chalk. Then, well pleased, he bade farewell to Baba Mustafa and returned to the forest. By and by, Morgiana, going out, saw the mark the robber had made, quickly guessed that some mischief was brewing, and fetching a piece of chalk, marked two or three doors on each side. The thief, meantime, told his comrades of his discovery. The captain thanked him and bade him show him the house he had marked. But when they came to it, they saw that five or six of the houses were chalked in the same manner. The guide was so confused that he knew not what answer to make, and when they returned he was at once beheaded for having failed. Another robber was sent out, and having won over Baba Mustafa, marked the house in red chalk. But as Morgiana was again too clever for them, the second messenger was put to death also. The captain now resolved to go himself, but wiser than the others, he did not mark the house, but looked at it so closely that he could not fail to remember it. He returned and ordered his men to go into the neighbouring villages and buy 19 mules and 38 leather jars, all empty except one, which was full of oil. The captain put one of his men, fully armed, into each, rubbing the outside of the jars with oil. Then the 19 mules were loaded with 37 robbers in jars and the jar of oil and reached the town by dusk. The captain stopped his mules in front of Ali Baba's house and said to Ali Baba, who was sitting outside for coolness, I have brought some oil from a distance to sell at tomorrow's market, but it is now so late that I know not where to pass the night, unless you will do me the favour to take me in. Though Ali Baba had seen the captain of the robbers in the forest, he did not recognise him in the disguise of an oil merchant. He bade him welcome, opened his gates for the mules to enter, and went to Morgiana to bid her prepare a bed and supper for his guest. He brought the stranger into his hall, and after they had supped, went again to speak to Morgiana in the kitchen, while the captain went into the yard under pretense of seeing after his mules, but really to tell his men what to do. Beginning at the first jar, and ending at the last, he said to each man, As soon as I throw some stones from the window of the chamber where I lie, cut the jars open with your knives and come out, and I will be with you in a trice. He returned to the house, and Morgiana led him to his chamber. She then told Abdullah, her fellow slave, to set on the pot some broth for her master, who had gone to bed. Meanwhile, her lamp went out, and she had no more oil in the house. Do not be uneasy, said Abdullah. Go into the yard and take some out of one of those jars. Morgiana thanked him for his advice, took the oil pot and went into the yard. When she came to the first jar, the robber inside said softly, Is it time? Any other slave but Morgiana on finding a man in the jar instead of the oil she wanted, would have screamed and made a noise. But she, knowing the danger her master was in, bethought herself of a plan and answered quietly, Not yet, but presently. She went to all the jars, giving the same answer, till she came to the jar of oil. She now saw that her master thinking to entertain an oil merchant, had let 38 robbers into his house. She filled her oil pot, went back to the kitchen, 
and having lit her lamp, went again to the oil jar and filled a large kettle full of oil. When it boiled, she went and poured enough oil into every jar to stifle and kill the robber inside. When this brave deed was done, she went back to the kitchen, put out the fire and the lamp, and waited to see what would happen. In a quarter of an hour, the captain of the robbers awoke, got up and opened the window. As all seemed quiet, he threw down some little pebbles which hit the jars. He listened. And as none of his men seemed to stir, he grew quite uneasy and went down into the yard. On going to the first jar and saying, Are you asleep? He smelt the hot, boiled oil and knew at once that his plot to murder Ali Baba and his household had been discovered. He found all the gang was dead. And missing the oil out of the last jar became aware of the manner of their death. He then forced the lock of a door leading into the garden, climbed over several walls and made his escape. Morgiana heard and saw all this, and rejoicing at her success, went to bed and fell asleep. At daybreak, Ali Baba arose, and seeing the oil jar still there, asked why the merchant had not gone with his mules. Morgiana bade him look in the first jar and see if there was any oil. Seeing a man, he started back in terror. Have no fear, said Morgiana. The man cannot harm you. He is dead. Ali Baba, when he had recovered somewhat from his astonishment, asked what had become of the merchant. Merchant, said she. He is no more merchant than I am. And she told him the whole story, assuring him that it was a plot of the robbers of the forest, of whom only three were left, and that the white and red chalk marks had something to do with it. Ali Baba at once gave Morgiana her freedom, saying that he owed her his life. Then they buried the bodies in Ali Baba's garden, while the mules were sold in the market by his slaves. The captain returned to his lonely cave, which seemed frightful to him without his lost companions, and firmly resolved to avenge them by killing Ali Baba. He dressed himself carefully and went into town, where he took lodgings in an inn. In the course of a great many journeys to the forest, he carried away many rich stuffs and much fine linen and set up a shop opposite that of Ali Baba's son. He called himself Koja Hassan, and as he was both civil and well-dressed, he soon made friends with Ali Baba's son, and through him with Ali Baba, whom he was continually asking to sup with him. Ali Baba, wishing to return his kindness, invited him into his house, and received him smiling, thanking him for his kindness to his son. When the merchant was about to take his leave, Ali Baba stopped him, saying, Where are you going, sir, in such a haste? Will you not stay and sup with me? The merchant refused, saying that he had a reason, and on Ali Baba's asking him what that was, he replied, It is, sir, it is, sir, that I can eat no food that has salt in it. If that is all, said Ali Baba, let me tell you that there shall be no salt in either the meat or the bread that we eat tonight. He went to give this order to Morgiana, who was much surprised. Who is this man, said she, who eats no salt with his meat? He is an honest man, Morgiana, returned her master. Therefore do as I bid you. But she could not withstand a desire to see this strange man. So she helped Abdullah to carry up the dishes and saw in a moment that Kodja Hassan was the robber captain and carried a dagger under his robes. I am not surprised, she said to herself, that this wicked man who intends to kill my master will eat no salt with him, but I will hinder his plans. She sent up the supper by Abdullah while she made ready for one of the boldest acts that could be thought on. When the dessert had been served, 
Kocha Hassan was left alone with Ali Baba and his son, whom he thought to make drunk, whom he thought to make drunk, and then to murder them. Morgiana, meanwhile, put on a headdress like a dancing girl's, and clasped a belt round her waist, from which hung a dagger with a silver hilt. And she said to Abdullah, Take your guitar and let us go and divert our master and his guest. Abdullah took his guitar and played before Morgiana until they came to the door where Abdullah stopped playing and Morgiana made a low curtsy. Come in, Morgiana, said Ali Baba, and let Kodja Hassan see what you can do. And turning to Kodja Hassan, he said, She's my slave and my housekeeper. Koja Hassan was by no means pleased, for he feared that his chance of killing Ali Baba was gone for the present. But he pretended eagerness to see Morgiana, and Abdallah began to play and Morgiana to dance. After she had performed several dances, she drew her dagger and made passes with it, sometimes pointing it at her own breast, sometimes at her master's, as if it were part of the dance. Suddenly, out of breath, she snatched the guitar from Abdallah with her left hand and holding the dagger in her right hand, held out the guitar to her master. Ali Baba and his son put a piece of gold into it and Kodja Hassan, seeing that she was coming to him, pulled out his purse to make her a present. But while he was putting his hand into it, Morgiana plunged the dagger into his heart. Unhappy girl! cried Ali Baba and his son. What have you done to ruin us? It was to preserve you, master, not to ruin you, answered Morgiana. See here, opening the false merchant's garment and showing the dagger. See what an enemy you have entertained. Remember he would eat no salt with you. And what more would you have? Look at him. He is both the false oil merchant and the captain of forty thieves. Ali Baba was so grateful to Morgiana for thus saving his life that he offered her to his son in marriage, who readily consented. And after a few days, the wedding was celebrated with greater splendor. At the end of the year, Ali Baba, hearing nothing of the two remaining robbers, judged that they were dead and set out to the cave. The door opened on his saying, Open sesame! He went in and saw that nobody had been there since the captain left it. He brought away as much gold as he could carry and returned to the town. He told his son the secret of the cave, which his son handed down in his turn. So the children and grandchildren of Ali Baba were rich to the end of their lives. And that was the story Nori of Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves from the 1001 Arabian Nights. I thought it was very exciting. Did you? If you would like to find out more about Bertie and his friends, you can drop by and visit him on his website at storynori.com. While you are there, you can also drop into Bertie's online shop I'll be back with another story, Nori, soon. Until then, from me, Natasha. Bye-bye.